Hello my friends, in this video we'll be taking a look at the Autosomal DNA Results GD match and predicted phenotype of two pitware people, uh, pitware culture individuals from Bronze Age Scandinavia. Um, these people were hunters and gatherers, however they coexisted with farmers who lived in Scandinavia and later, for a certain period of time, a couple centuries, they even coexisted with the Indo-Europeans, with the battle axe Indo-Europeans who came into Scandinavia and started uh, spreading Indo-European languages into this uh, this region. So let's begin with these two men. They both have the same haplogroups, both maternal and paternal. Oh, uh, now this is Ajvide58, and despite having blue eye haplotype 3, which means he also has blue eye haplotype 2 and 1, uh, you cannot have BH3 without BH2 and BH1, and you cannot have BH2 without BH1. There's a sort of a hierarchy that exists here. Uh, there's a specific phylogeny that exists to these blue eye haplotypes. I suggest you do research it, because I do have a video on my channel discussing them. Uh, so we know that he has BH2 and BH1 as well, and despite this, he is still predicted to have black hair and brown eyes, not dark brown, okay, but brown eyes and black hair, despite this kind of a very Nordic uh, genotype in the Oka2 and Herc2 region. How come? Well, the reason for that is because he lacks the Eurasian light skin mutation in SLC24A5. So from that, I deducted that he would probably be a little bit darker skinned, and my Nashakot does take this into account along with some other genotypes, which is the reason he's predicted to have such dark pigmentation of eyes and hair. Uh, this variation does affect the color of eyes and hair quite greatly. Uh, he also has two draft variants in this IRF4 variation, which is basically the European hunter-gatherer blue eye plus red hair plus pale skin variants, and this did contribute to his 7.05% uh, red hair score. However, it's not enough to give him blue eyes, it's not enough to give him light uh, color of eyes and hair, despite everything, despite even having BH3, uh, despite all of this, he's still quite dark in color because of all the other genotypes, SLC24A5, SLC45A2, all the package, uh, the whole package is very dark, very dark individual. But if he took a 23andMe test and uh, was looking at his eye color prediction, his eye color prediction with 23andMe would be very blue because of his um, having BH2. Now, when it comes to Ajvida 70, Mina Shakot predicts him to have blue eyes, Greek shaped nose, and blonde hair, but in reality, Mina Shakot was not able to impute his genotype for blue eye haplotype 2, uh, which is the most important variation for, you know, eye and hair color, and for blue eye haplotype 1 and 3. None of this is present in his file, however, I did a little bit of research into his file, and I found a couple of SNPs that are basically very strongly predictive of him having blue eye haplotype 2. He definitely has blue eye haplotype 2, so you see this prediction where he's got 28% likelihood of blue eyes, uh, 44% likelihood of blonde hair. In reality, if we had the complete file for him, those numbers would be twice higher. Twice higher numbers for blue eyes, and maybe one and a half times or twice higher for blonde hair. He is very light colored. And this prediction for blue eyes, Greek shaped nose, and blonde hair, this was actually done without any relevant genotypes in the Oka2 and Herc2 region, especially, well, not without any, because there is one uh, variant you can see colored in black on the right, but without any important variations being found in this file, he is still predicted to have blonde hair and blue eyes, very light color individuals. Uh, very light color individual. However, he does have one very, you know, I would say exotic genotype in the Keto G gene, where he has no drought variants in this Keto G variation, and this variation has to do with skin color, and, um, well, it, it contributes to eye color, hair color too, but it mainly has to do with skin color, and he would have slightly darker skin based on his genotype in this variation, but really, um, really, it probably wouldn't matter all that much. He would still be quite uh, Nordic, quite uh, blonde and blue-eyed in terms of phenotype. Now I'm going to show you the GD match results of Ajvida58. You're going to see the GD match results of both individuals. And the reason I'm showing you GD match here and not the G25, the unofficial G25, and there is an unofficial G25 coordinate for Ajvida58 is because I don't trust it. I don't think it's legitimate whatsoever. It goes in contrast with what's typical for pitware culture people. It's completely unlike all the other pitware samples. And it goes completely in contrast with what I see with uh, G. GD match results for this sample. With GD match, it's very clear that this sample has Neolithic admixture, plenty of Neolithic admixture, just as much Neolithic admixture as do uh, all the other pitware people, and the and just as much Neolithic admixture as what's typical for pitware people in general. This individual is not an outlier in the slightest. Nothing about this uh, result suggests that this is an outlier sample, and. But if you look at the G25 for this sample, it looks entirely hunter-gatherer. It would definitely be an atypical sample for pitware culture, but it doesn't look like that at all with GED match. And 
I just don't trust the results. I don't trust the results at all. Uh, I don't trust this unofficial G G25 spreadsheet whatsoever. And this is why I'm also not showing you the G25 results for HV the 70, because even though HV the 70 G G25 looks a lot Sim very similar to reality, very similar to what I see with GD match. I still don't trust it because what if there was some kind of a mix up? What if the person who was compiling the spreadsheet put something else that's completely different in place of HV the 58 and they could make the same mistake with HV the 70? I don't trust the reliability of this whole uh, spreadsheet. At this point, I don't trust the rely. I don't. Re I don't uh, consider the spreadsheet to be reliable. That's the problem. So that's why I'm not showing you the G25 for these two samples, and I don't have the money to go and uh, buy official G25 for 20 24 bucks. But from GD match, it looks like this individual is a typical pitware individual, and same with HV the 70. They are both very typical pitware individuals with around 20, maybe 15 to 25 percent of Neolithic admixture and the rest European hunter gatherer admixture. Now we'll be taking a look at HV the 70 GD match results and from the GD match results it looks like this is a typical pitware individual. In fact, a little bit northern shifted, a little bit shifted towards uh, the hunter gatherers. Uh, still around 13 or 15 percent. Uh, you can see with MDLPK11 it's only 13 percent uh, Neolithic admixture, but some of the EHG uh, here is southern admixture too, since EHG represents a Caucasus components. So there's quite a lot of a southern admixture in this individual, but it's still kind of on the low side in terms of uh, Neolithic admixture uh, for the pitware people. It's a little bit lower actually than what's typical for them, for this group of humans. Uh, with with um, the unofficial G25 spreadsheet, it looks like this individual has 20% Anatolian Neolithic admixture, which does seem it does seem like it's in the range based on these results. It does seem like it's in the range of somewhere somewhere correct. However. On that same spreadsheet, as I mentioned previously, the HV58 individual seems to have only 3% Neolithic admixture, which is yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it would be a very atypical result for a pitware pit person, first of all, and second of all, it grossly contradicts what we see with the GED match for this sample. That's why I'm not showing you the G25 results, even for the HV70, because even though it looks correct, even though it looks like it should be matching up with what I see on GED match, I still don't trust it. I still don't know if it is correct. What if, if I were to upload this file to, I don't know, Davidsky, pay him twenty-four dollars? What if it, it would be different? I don't know. I don't know, and I don't trust. I don't trust whoever made that G twenty-five spreadsheet. I don't trust that person nearly enough to start uh, using that in my videos. Uh, now we'll be taking a look at the autosomal DNA results traits of HV the seventy which would be the blue eye guy. So HV the 70 has got CT genotype in MAOA's RS6323, uh, leading to lower activity of the MAOA. M -A -O -A. I need to work on my pronunciation. I really do. If I want to make a career here on YouTube, I got to like make sure I pronounce stuff correctly. So this is the MAOA enzyme, uh, which just like the COMT cont enzyme breaks down dopamine and having lower activity of the enzyme that breaks down dopamine you can probably guess what that leads to that leads to higher dopamine levels and advantages in memory tasks attention tasks however disadvantages in stress resiliency um, this individual AJV70 uh, has TT genotype in RS25531 which leads to long form 5 htlpr and higher risk of depression uh, this is a genotype that leads to a specific phenotype, right? So, but we don't really know for sure because there is also this genotype right here, uh, which is not in the file. So it is possible to have, for example, TT here, but because you have heterozygous genotype, you end up having long form 5 htlpr Long form 5 htlpr is actually a very dominant thing to have. Like if you have one allele for it, in either of the two um, variations, you have long form 5 htlpr That's how it works. It's very dominant. So for example, somebody like me, I have... Uh, heterozygous genotype in both of the variations, so I definitely have a uh, long form 5 HTTLPR, but despite it being a dominant phenotype, it's actually pretty rare, and most people don't have it. Most people have short form 5 HTTLPR, uh, most people have therefore slightly uh, high risk of depression. 5 HTTLPR, it's very, it's very interesting by the way, because uh, 5 HTTLPR is, is a gene it's 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 a part of your genome right it's uh you can see it under a microscope it's a repeat of uh it's a repeat of of a certain sequence right however uh 
it's also predicted by another genotype that's in a nearby location. So this is a genotype that leads to a low short form 5-HTTLPR, which is actually a phenotype. So 5-HTTLPR status, whether it's short form or long form, it's a phenotype, but it's a phenotype within your DNA. It's kind of like how there's variations that predict how long your telomeres are. Uh, the length of your telomeres is also a phenotype, but it's it's it has to do with your DNA, which is pretty cool, pretty interesting. Uh, and so Ashvita 70 does not have a long form 5 HTTLPR. He's got short form 5 HTTLPR, some problems transporting serotonin, and slightly higher odds of depression, just like pretty much 90% of you guys. Uh, pretty much like 90% of you guys also have short form 5 HTTLPR, just like Ashvita 70, but not like me. Not like me. I have long form. Um, no micro P, you know what that is. I can't pronounce that in. Uh, greater detail because YouTube and I have to stay monetizer. I have to stay child friendly, very PG 13 clean. I can't be pronouncing stuff like that, but you know what that is. Uh, he's got two fat gene variants in FTOs RS 1939 609, much higher odds of obesity and sleep apnea. Uh, yes, obesity and sleep apnea are actually related, these are related conditions. Um, I am pretty, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty overweight. I wouldn't say I classify myself as obese, but I'm pretty overweight and I don't have sleep apnea, but I do have an uncle who's even more overweight than I am and he does have sleep apnea. So, you know, it is what it is. And I, the reason I'm overweight, it's, it's, some of it has to do with genetics, but it's mostly not about genetics in my case. So, um, this individual is not a carrier of any of the albinism mutations and we're going to check his polygenic risk scores. For polygenic risk scores, he's got slightly above average score for schizophrenia, significantly above average score for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and nothing was found for Alzheimer's. Okay, so this is Ashvita 70. We're going to reset everything now. And now we're going to take a look at Ashvita 58. Something is wonky with my microphone. I, I've been recording this video and I notice it sounds much louder than the way I actually pronounce it. So you see I'm holding the mic at a pretty significant distance from my face for that reason. Okay, so Ashvita 58 has got AA genotype in this DRD2 variation, uh, which means increased number of dopamine D2 receptors and higher risk of schizophrenia. This is also predictive of the G genotype in Pro 19 Pro, uh, meaning no no go learner. Very. I have some pronunciation difficulties. You might have noticed. Um, trying to work on them. But this individual basically most likely, because there is a, a linkage here between these two vari variations, most likely this individual does not have any no-go learner variants in Pro Frenetin Pro, which basically means he's, this individual is not a no-go learner. Uh, it also means this individual is be, not being a no-go learner mean, means uh, you are not likely to withhold your response. You are very much uh, likely to give a response even when it's not really warranted. For example, uh, in real world scenario, you might be unprovoked, but you still respond to it, or you might be uh, so you, you might you might be interacting with somebody and they haven't even uh, said anything that would suggest an insult to you, but you still got offended. That's the way I see it. Uh, maybe it's inaccurate. You can you can correct me if you think that's inaccurate. That's the way I interpret this no go learner stuff. Um, probably is inaccurate. <laughs> But you can correct me. From what I understand, no-go learners tend to um, withhold a response when it's warranted, whereas people who are not no-go learners tend to give a response even when it's not warranted. So that's the way I understand it. Um, no micro P, once again, and eight points higher IQ than individuals with AA genotype, big brain, higher IQ. Um, not a carrier for any of the albinism mutations. However, he does have this genotype right here, which leads to seven times. I keep pronouncing it as seven. It's six. I don't know. For some reason, I keep reading six as seven. So this individual has six times increased the risk of cleft lip. And uh, I think if he had cleft lip, that would be very apparent from the skeleton because it's an actual deformity within your upper palate, within your... Uh, they call it maxilla. Uh, there is a opening, like it's split up. It's it's literally, I don't know how to describe it, but if you see like um, photos of people with, of the palates 
of people with cleft lip, they all have the same kind of like really screwed up deformity where the, the roof is completely missing. So you should pro you will probably be able to see that from the skeleton. And I haven't done much research into um, into this sample. Maybe he did have cleft lip. I don't know. I don't. I don't do this kind of research. I just make videos about genetics. I don't do the research into into the uh, details of where it was found, what time, all the carbon dating, all that stuff. I just do videos about genetics, right? So if you want to do the research for me and type in the comments, if you find that this individual had a cleft lip, that would be very interesting for me to read. And we're going to look at polygenic risk scores. So this is Ashvida 58. Yes, Ashvida 58 has four times the average odds of schizophrenia for Northern Europeans, very high odds of schizophrenia. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say very high. Uh, I wouldn't say very high, actually, because four times, four times 0.4% is still like 1.6%. So I wouldn't say very high odds for that, for that illness in particular, because it's a super rare illness. Uh, he does have slightly higher odds of type 2 diabetes, and he's not genetic for anything for Alzheimer's. So that's pretty much all there is to it to uh, AJV58. Well, thanks for watching my video until the end. You can download both of these samples in 2050 format from the link which is in the description of the video. And um, leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. Goodbye.